This is a panel called Clean Energy and National Security. Um, each year, uh, when we're talking with our caucus co-chairs, Senator Reid and Senator Crapo, um, this is the panel that they are especially interested in. They want to make sure um, that these topics get brought up uh, in the context of renewable energy and energy efficiency, and we couldn't agree more. They're really, really important. Um, of course, Senator uh, Reid, uh, Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, Senator Crapo, represents Idaho, uh, home of Idaho National Lab, doing some really, really impressive work on all of this. Um, Senator Reid joined us earlier, and we are thrilled to have Senator Crapo join us by video remarks. So my colleague Dan O'Brien will hit play, and we'll hear what Senator Crapo has to say, and then we'll get underway. Hello. Hello. Thank you all for attending the 2023 Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. I extend my gratitude to EESI for putting this expo together every year. Additionally, I thank my co-chair, Senator Reed, as well as our deputy co-chairs, Senator Collins and Senator Van Hollen, for their collaboration on the caucus's important issues. The REEE caucus and EESI provide valuable opportunities to share ideas across the aisle and find bipartisan support for different clean energy objectives. Over the last three years, this country has seen unprecedented growth in the renewable energy sector. This growth has contributed to our national energy supply and security. I am particularly proud to represent Idaho, where roughly 80% of our electricity comes from clean energy sources, 60% from hydropower, and 20% from renewables. Idaho is also a national leader in the development of new clean energy technology, thanks to numerous research initiatives and public-private partnerships at the Idaho National Laboratory. INL is making continuous breakthroughs in green technology, in fields such as electric vehicle efficiency, biomass fuels, and nuclear fuel and power generation. Here in the Senate, we have made significant legislative breakthroughs, supporting these efforts over the past few years as well. The bipartisan infrastructure law allocated significant funding for long overdue efficiency and improvement projects across the country. The Growing Climate Solutions Act was also signed into law last Congress. This law enables those in the agriculture and land use sectors to voluntarily sequester carbon at a cost-effective rate. The law also allows the U.S. Department of Agriculture to provide information to farmers looking to implement practices that capture carbon, reduce emissions, improve soil health, and make operations more sustainable. I look forward to continued work on the REEE caucus to further good bipartisan legislation that benefits all Americans, both rural and urban. The answers to our energy security needs can be found here, with input from valuable members of the energy industry from across the political spectrum. Again, thank you for coming to today's expo and lending your time and experience to these discussions. I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you, Senator Crapo, and thank you, Dano, for helping us with the video. Um, Senator Crapo uh, is a, a tremendous member to work with. His staff is awesome. He also worked with us on our April 19th briefing with Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, Katie Huff, uh, talking about the cool work uh, underway across the Department of Energy uh, to um, develop um, advanced nuclear technologies. And we couldn't have done that briefing without Senator Crapo as well. So without any further ado, that brings us to our panel, uh, Clean Energy and National Security. Um, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, and then have a seat, and then we'll go down through the line. We'll have a great discussion, and uh, extremely happy to have everyone here on the live cast as well as in person. And our first speaker is Paul Farnan. Paul is Deputy Assistant Secretary for, of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. Paul, thank you, much, thank you so much for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, renewable energy and energy efficiency is absolutely critical to the Army's mission. On the battlefield, it means increased capability and greater protection for our soldiers. And on installations here at home, it means increased resilience. First on the battlefield, um, if we can reduce the amount of fuel we use in our tactical vehicles, that reduces the amount of fuel we actually have to move to the battlefront. 
Uh, it reduces the amount of fuel the Navy has to truck across uh, the very large Pacific Ocean. It recruce, reduces the amount of warships the Navy has to use to protect those convoy lines. It reduces the amount of fuel we have to move from the port to the front lines and thus reduces the amount of combat soldiers we have to use to protect those. So it will actually increase the capabilities of the forces on the front line. The vehicles can remain on station longer. Um, and so what we're doing is through anti-idle kits, uh, hybridization and eventually electrification. Uh, and let me just address one point really quick that seems to be a misunderstanding in some parts. Uh, the Army is not going to electrify all of our battle tanks tomorrow, okay? It's not going to happen anytime soon. Our strategy calls for full electrification of tactical vehicles in 2050, 30 years from now. Um, what we will do is we will do whatever we can to reduce the amount of fuel through hybridization and anti-idle kits. So our tactical vehicles, when they're out on the battlefield, they actually sit for long periods of time. But because everything's electrified, you've got to run the engine. You've got radars, radios, and other communications, night vision goggles, you name it, uh, it's electrified, so you have to run the engine. If we can install these anti-idle kits uh, or hybrid, full hybridization, be able to turn the engine off, then that extends the amount of time that these uh, vehicles can stay on station and what happens when you turn the engines off? You reduce the noise and the heat. And what are the two ways the enemy finds you? Noise and heat. So not only are we saving fuel and increasing the capability of the force on the front lines, but we're increasing the protection for our soldiers, making them less of a target. Uh, this is a very real threat. Um, and also with our contingency bases, our forward operating bases, uh, they're all in remote areas. Everything is powered by diesel generators. Same deal, everything's electrified, you need diesel fuel. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we took 1,000 casualties moving fuel convoys to these contingency bases. Uh, if we can reduce the amount of fuel that we use on these contingency bases by a third or a half, that's half the amount of fuel convoys we have to move. That's half the combat soldiers that have to go out and protect those lines. That's half the casualties we're going to take. So by using more efficient generators, by tying them together with microgrids, adding some battery storage, where appropriate, add portable renewable generation to increase the load further. Uh, this is actually a real impact uh, to the soldiers fighting the battles. And real quickly on the installations, um, anything, any kind of energy that comes from outside the fence line is vulnerable. Um, every Army installation, every military installation in this country gets their power just like everybody else does uh, in their homes from the grid. If the grid goes down, look, if there's a war again, we are in a contested homeland. Okay, we've never had to fight a war before in a contested homeland. So it's been very easy to get the forces out the door and overseas to the battlefield. But we will never fight another war that's not in a contested homeland. The first shot of the next war isn't necessarily going to be a bullet or an artillery shell. It's going to be a cyber attack. We have to expect that the grid's going to go down, not for hours or days, but possibly for weeks or months. Our installations have to be able to function. If, it comes from, if power comes from outside of the fence line, it's vulnerable. We've got a lot of diesel generators we use for emergency backup power. We have a seven-day supply or thereof. Uh, of diesel fuel on the basis. Great, we're good for seven days, providing those generators can run for 24 seven for a week. And most backup generators end up conking out after a day or two. Um, but what happens on day eight when we run out of diesel fuel? If there's no electricity out in town, there's no way to pump that diesel fuel, we're probably not gonna be able to resupply. Um, same with natural gas. We have natural gas generators on our bases. That natural gas pipeline comes from off base. That pipeline is vulnerable. It's gotta be self-contained. Uh, renewable generation is the best way to do that. So the more generation we can put on our bases uh, from generation, battery storage, and efficiencies, because every efficiency we get is that much less power generation we need, so we're that much closer um, to full resilience. So just to reemphasize, renewable energy, um, energy efficiency is critical to the capabilities of the Army, and it's going to enable us to win future wars. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Our second panelist today is Jake Gentle. Uh, Jake is Program Manager, Infrastructure, Security, Idaho National Lab. Jake, thanks for making your way uh, east to join us today. Hey, thanks, Dan. So I'm going to read you a couple of things I've captured throughout the day. I think it's been an excellent uh, set of discussions and opportunities to, to really elevate the criticality of this conversation. So again, thanks for inviting me, uh, making my way out uh, east from Idaho. I'm proud to say I am from Idaho. Spent my time here in D.C. Uh, back in 2014, 15, and 16, uh, headed back home. So I think earlier in the, in the discussion today, there was conversation around of uh, be proud of where you're from and, and don't be afraid to stay there. Uh, I have left, but I went back. Uh, I think what's important to me is, is maintaining that connectivity. Um, but again, you know, as I mentioned, Idaho National Laboratory, we are the lead uh, nuclear energy laboratory. 
And what I would say is our vision is our vision statement is very much in line with this panel. Uh, and I'll read it to you here. So our vision is to change the world's energy future and secure our nation's critical infrastructure. Seems very fitting for a panel like, like today. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight too is um, a lot of the statistics we've heard already throughout the day is, is pointing us in the right direction. So I'm gonna repeat a couple of those, maybe add uh, some color to maybe the global mix. So in 2022, global electricity generation from wind and solar was around 12%. Nuclear, about 10%. Here in the US, Wind, 10.2% in 2022. Solar, 3.4%. Uh, Hydropower, 6.2%. And nuclear making up that consistent uh, about 18%. So one thing I want to note is, uh, I think we heard earlier, is a, a tripling in transmission infrastructure is needed between now and uh, pick your date, 2030, 2035. Uh, I think I've also heard that um, there was, uh, solar is expected to triple by 2028. So if you think how much work we have ahead of us just in those two categories, I think the, the opportunity is there. We also heard recently it's an opportunity to be here uh, in this time in which what we're uh, embarking upon. But one, one major emphasis I want to make is to ensure that we are enabling clean energy to be part of the continued national security mission, doing things right from the start. So it takes time and effort to pivot our generation fleet. I think what we're trying to do is ensure that we're doing it in a secure and resilient way. Uh, we've got a lot of existential threat happening upon us every day. And one thing we want to make sure is we are re resilient to those disruptions. Now, whether we look at it from a distribution system, a transmission system, uh, even residential or microgrid applications, forward operating bases, I think we want to make sure that we are uh, ensuring that our infrastructure must reliably, and I'll underline that, reliably provide for U.S. energy needs. So reliably, uh, reliably uh, or reliability, sorry, is, is kind of something I want to underline through continued cyber-informed engineering best practices, public-private partnerships, and one of those examples that I'll offer uh, one of the earlier panelists uh, from the Solar Energy Industries Association is INL and, and SIA partnered up to develop what we call secure renewables. It's now in our second year. We just completed that workshop uh, in, in April, and that's really to bring two groups together, the renewables, clean energy community, and those who are in charge with securing our nation's infrastructure and cybersecurity experts. So that's kind of a, a new formulation of opportunities. I, I remember in 2018, even with ACP, we partnered up to put together one of the first uh, cybersecurity panel sessions for the, the American Wind Energy Association at the time. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to kind of articulate is we can't do this alone. Uh, I think we have to do this in combination with public-private partnerships, private and public alone, uh, but that at the same time allow new uh, organizations to, to show up and fill in gaps. One of those is, the new Clean Energy Security Coalition, something that I think is important. They represent a great group, and it's, it's kind of building out as they go underway. So the time is now, put security into practice. I think that's my undertone, is put it into practice, and we can't wait. I think we have to start now. We really need to foster the secure by design mindset, because, that, because what's ahead of us, like existential threats, will require proactive security and resilience planning. Thank you, Jake. Our third panelist today is Jennifer Schaefer. Jennifer is the Executive Director of the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition. Jennifer, always great to see you. Thanks for being on the panel today. We'll turn it over to you. I never know. Partnerships. <laughs> Partnerships. So I love what you talked about, public-private partnerships. Yay. Um, I represent the FPCC, as, among other things. I'm very involved in energy efficiency policy. but. Uh, the FPCC is made up of energy service companies who do, do work with the federal government. They're on master contracts to basically have hunting license to go out and do work with the federal government. Um, a lot of work with the Department of Defense, so I will definitely be uh, riffing off of some of what Paul talked about. Um, but uh, I, you guys did hear, if anybody was here at the beginning of the day, you heard a little bit about performance contracting from Brian Krug, who was on the very first panel of the day. But just as a quick, uh, in a nutshell, in an ESPC, um, an energy service company like a Siemens, a, a Amoresco, a Train, they um, go to a facility, help develop a project that's focused on um, making the, the, the base, the facility more resilient, secure, um, and more uh, efficient. Um, they, do, they get the financing to do the project, so cost nothing incremental to the federal partner, they install everything, they hire subcontractors, they enter into a long-term contract to get paid back over time from energy savings. Um, 
And they also measure and verify those savings every year, make sure they're occurring, um, and they guarantee that the savings will occur. So it's a real nice way for the feds to get more um, uh, for nothing except their utility bill, right? They paid 100 bucks the utility before, they enter into an ESPC, they pay 60 bucks the utility, they pay the ESCO 38 bucks, and they keep $2 until the end of the contract, then they keep all the dollars. So that's how they work. I know this is a resiliency panel, not an energy savings performance contracting panel, but my point is, as we get more involved in more, when cybersecurity and resiliency are, are much more necessary and of interest, how can we use performance contracting to do that? Everything we do now as a ESPC, in an ESPC and a UESC utility contract, um, we have to have it be cyber secure. That doesn't necessarily pay for itself through energy savings, but we have enough energy savings from all those great efficiency provisions that we've got in the, in the package to, to make that work. Resiliency also can pay for itself. And oh, by the way, energy efficiency is resiliency. And Paul mentioned that, which I really appreciate. Um, but I guess the point I wanted to make is, as we try to get sort of fence-to-fence -fence resiliency, how do we have backup power that really does last more than a day or two? Because he's not wrong. Those things are crapping out on us pretty early in the process, many of them. So we've got to make sure we have the resiliency we think we have. Um, how do we get more? for less. One way is to use the appropriated dollars that we have now, and there is money in the system, to leverage more with performance contracting. Case in point, the Energy Resilient uh, ERSEP program, Energy Resiliency and Conservation Investment Program, it's a MILCON program. It's very focused on resiliency. It's about $550 million today for this year, 2024, I guess. Um, very focused on buying resiliency, getting those microgrids on our bases. Great, we need to do that. You could probably use less of those ERSIP dollars in connection with a performance contract where you get maybe a smaller microgrid and you supplement it with more microgrid that you get from a performance contract that's paid for by those energy savings that are accrued over the long term. So you can see how we can leverage the dollars that are available today to really make a difference. Um, there are other dollars available today. Uh, thank you to Congress. Thank you. You guys uh, appropriated money starting in uh, 2019 for the Affect Grant Program. It's a DOE grant program that leverages performance contracting, about 40 to 1 leverage. That's 40 bucks from the private sector for every dollar the feds pay. Uh, we like that. Um, it's good for the, the taxpayer. Um, that money also, there was additional funding uh, in the IIJA for that program. So there are dollars you can use operations and maintenance dollars to leverage more in a performance contract. The GSA has money. And importantly, energy service companies can monetize the investment tax credits for the federal government. Federal government does not have the ability to get them like we have ways now of the IRA that allow state and local governments to take the credit Feds cannot just take the credit, but an ESCO can on behalf of the federal government and pass through those savings. So there's lots of ways to pay for that resiliency that's so important. And that's all for me. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, our fourth panelist is Jeremy Harrell. Jeremy is Chief Strategy Officer at ClearPath. Jeremy, welcome to the panel. Great to see you. Awesome. Great to see you too, Daniel. I really appreciate it and really appreciate the EIS uh, team for inviting me. And uh, you know, as a former Senate uh, Energy staffer, I uh, always enjoyed this this summit. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, great to be on the other side of, uh, of the panel uh, now uh, here at ClearPath. For those of you who may not know ClearPath uh, at the onset, uh, we're a DC-based advocacy and research organization focused on policies that accelerate technological innovation to reduce and remove global emissions. And, and I want to just underscore the, the the global component of that. Um, so eff effectively, we're, we're, we're a, a climate organization, and, and we're looking to, to take on the, the global energy challenges needed to meet the globe's energy security and climate change uh, 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 needs moving forward. And, and so that global component um, and, and the way we view the U.S. and where we think U.S. policy should be steered is the U.S.'s role as uh, an early mover, as a, as a developing world who's leading on these technologies and leading on climate action. And then second, as, as a technology provider to the globe. Uh, we have a robust research development demonstration apparatus in this country. Uh, Department of Energy, our uh, academic institutions, American entrepreneurship, the, the power of private finance and, and, uh, and the private sector in this country that truly can lead both 
our energy transformation here in the U.S. and in the global energy transformation. And fortunately, Congress agrees with that vision as well. We've seen over the last five years really significant public policy driving towards those means. Uh, a lot of attention has been given to the, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, but really uh, four big bills over the last five years that have gotten across the finish line, three of them that have been bipartisan, that are making investments on that very thesis. The U.S. should lead both as an early actor and as a global technology provider. And so the Energy Act of 2020, at the very end of, of the, the Trump administration, big bipartisan legislation at the time was maybe one of the, the single largest investments in clean energy since the Energy Act of 2005. The infrastructure bill that uh, led to, to more than $62 billion of investment in public-private partnerships. Uh, the Chips and Science Act that really looked to, to drive and, and invest in our supply chains. And then uh, tax incentives established by the Inflation Reduction Act at the end of, of last Congress. And so I think it's really important for, for a couple areas as we think about that, from think about resiliency as a whole. Um, one... Uh, over the last five years, we've made a strong, as a country, made taken the position that we're going to invest in these technologies and the supply chains here at home. Um, and so a big focus on, on the incentives, as well as the, the Department of Energy public-private partnerships on how do we ensure that we we maximize the impact for American manufacturing? How do we lead in, in next generation manufacturing? I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle as we think about the supply chain. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about critical minerals lately, and it's, it's been a big, big uh, focus here on, on Capitol Hill as we look at like, how do we source materials that we need for this clean energy transformation? And uh, there's really some telling statistics out there that you know, the US is reliant on you know, 12 of the 50 quote unquote critical minerals the government has established, uh, almost 100% reliant, and, and uh, over 50% reliant on another 30 of those. And China is the leader in, in 30 plus of those. And so how do we develop more here? How do we innovate so we need to use different resources to produce these projects? And how do we you know, partner with our allies abroad to, to meet our needs? And then secondly, I, I think that's been really important over, over the course of those five bills has been the investment in uh, resiliency technologies, whether that's grid um, technologies, whether it's uh, reducing energy consumption with efficiency, whether it's direct investment in, uh, in firm flexible generation as a whole, um, or energy storage. And, and those big energy bills that have gotten across the finish lines have, have tried to catalyze demonstrations in new long duration storage programs, in particular like a long duration DOD pro storage program that recently was launched the Energy Storage Grand Challenge at DOE, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program at DOE that's demonstrating new, new nuclear designs, and even a, a big enhanced geothermal systems uh, uh, a demonstration that DOE has launched it in the geothermal office as well. These are technologies that we know we're going to need to meet our, our long-term uh, ne energy needs economically and from a secure standpoint, and are, are really uh, what is demanded um, um, across the globe as we ramp up uh, renewable generation, which is a really important piece of the puzzle as well. And so I think you know, as we look towards the end of the year here in Congress, I think you're going to continue to hear those type of themes, whether it's the NDAA on the floor in the Senate over the next couple of weeks, looking at how do we re improve resiliency, invest in microgrids, um, do more storage, and, and even maybe source a microreactor for, for a base. The permitting reform debate has been really focused on that. How do, we, how do we build at the pace needed to meet what could be a doubling of the capacity of the U.S. grid? Um, and so uh, I think it's a really ample spot for bipartisan policy agreement. We've seen that over the last five years across multiple different uh, political machinations, if you will. And, and I'm confident we're going to continue to see it because of the, the strong leadership that we've seen from folks like Senator Crapo, Senator Reid, and others. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. That was great. Um, so to kick off our discussion, I'm going to stand up so that I can see the audience. If anyone has any questions, we will gladly call upon you. Uh, and um, Georgia is in the back with our, she's our microphone wrangler for this panel. So, but to get us, to, to get us started, um, renewable energy and energy efficiency contribute to national security. I think, Paul, you laid that out very clearly at the beginning. And many of you have sort of reinforced that idea that they also, it also contributes to resilience. But there's lots of different types of resilience. There's uh, community resilience, there's infrastructure resilience, there's grid resilience, there's supply chain resilience. And I'm curious, sort of from your different perspectives, and Paul, perhaps we'll start with you and then we can go down through the line. You know, how do investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, sort of as a resilience play, how do those bubble up in your eyes to contribute to overall sort of US national security, sort of higher level national security? Well, in a contested homeland, which we are in, as I stated, if the 
you can no longer really separate the operational side from the installation side. When I was a young Navy lieutenant, you know, we didn't care about the installation stuff that was happening. It's like, oh, whatever, I'm going to go fly my helicopter and I don't care what happens on the base. Um, but that's the senior commander, the operational commanders no longer can separate themselves from the installation. Um, but the war starts here. The war doesn't start in some European or some Asian battlefield. The war starts here in this country, um, you know, at, at Fort Drum or Fort Cavazos or uh, JBLM. That's where the first shot's going to be fired, and that's where the forces have to be able to generate and operate from. Uh, look, if the installation is not working, uh, the forces aren't getting to the battlefield. Um, and it's you mentioned community resilience, and I want to kind of touch on that as well. Uh, particularly for the Army and for the military. Um, anyone that's been on a military installation knows there is no difference between the military installation and the community. Uh, they're one and the same. Um, our people live in the community. Their kids go to school in the community. They shop in the community. Their neighbors in the community. Uh, if the community isn't working, then the installation is not going to be able to work. Uh, we've been talking a lot about electricity. Look, we can make our re uh, installations 100% resilient. But if the grid goes down and the community is not tied into that installation and the resilience, the grid might, uh, the installation might be bright and warm and lit up like a Christmas tree. But if the community is cold and dark, how much do you think the soldiers are going to be focused on their mission when their spouse and their kids are at home alone in the dark and in the cold and with no running water or heat? Um, that's going to be a problem. And also the civilians, uh, every civilian that works on our installation in, you know, thousands and tens of thousands on some of them, that's what makes the installation operate. That's what makes, uh, you know, the planes be able to take off carrying the forces that gets, uh, the roads fixed, um, and everything operating on the base without that civilian workforce, the installation doesn't run. And again, if the community isn't working, then they're not going to be able to get to the installation. So it all kind of, it, it ties together. Everything, whether it's the community, uh, resi uh, community resilience, the installation resilience, it all, fight, it all contributes up to that uh, larger war. What, what's the, uh, that old poem? For want of a bullet, the battle was lost, and it goes all the way down to for want of a nail or for want of whatever. It starts at in installation. If, if that's not working, it doesn't matter how well-trained the 82nd Airborne is. If they can't get to the battlefield then the war's lost. Hope everything is okay. <laughs> um, Jake, uh, from your perspective, how do sort of different forms of resilience sort of bubble up to national security? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with knowledge. I think our previous, was a previous uh, session talked about um, workforce training, uh, workforce development. The engineering answer is it depends. Uh, and so in, in order for you to have pure resilience metrics, you need to be informed of what you're trying to defend yourself from or what you have actually as an asset to defend. And so when I think about resilience metrics, I think about knowledge first. I think we have to be informed. I think one of the earlier questions from the day was, uh, as a homeowner, how do I know how to, uh, who, who to go with for my installation on my rooftop solar, my energy storage, my energy efficiency program? How do I interpret my utility bill? In order to be resilient, I think you have to be knowledgeable. So that's, that's the first thing is to, to start with some knowledge uh, of what it is you're trying to be resilient uh, for and against. Uh, same thing with uh, remote and rural uh, communities. It may not have the connectivity needed to be resilient. Another comment from earlier was um, uh, getting access to those remote and rural communities so that they have the ability to be restored quickly. Because if you don't know you're out of power, or if, if the host or the, the youth service and utility doesn't know you're out, how do they know to restore you? Um, the other thing, too, is, is forward operating bases and other locations. Uh, we work a lot with the U.S. Army Central Command looking at specific locations. Uh, and we, we start here a lot of times with some of those technology demonstrations and innovation so that we, we know that after it's deployed uh, in, in operating bases that those technologies are going to work together. So to be resilient, you have to be interoperable, not only from the control system and be a secure control system, but also for those who have to repair and maintain the systems. Uh, not in all locations do you have a host nation that's, that's favorable. You mentioned this. And so if, if we have the ability to be resilient against not only the attack, but also the lack of knowledge on how to repair and restore, you know, generators crap out. We've heard that too. So how do you be resilient? You have to know how. And so then you also have to know what you're being resilient against. And Jennifer, you, I'm sure, can draw upon sort of very specific examples of this, but 
um, from you know investments in energy efficiency specifically and contributing to to resilience? Well, I think resilience is so many different things to so many different people, and I guess I don't want to get into definitions. I mean, yes, it's resilience against weather events, climate. It's resilience in our grid. It's resilience in our community. It's the resilience of the human spirit. Um, as Paul talked about, it's resilient in our bases. I, I had somebody at DOD tell me, well, we need to be resilient because we want the ability to take a punch and punch back. Okay, that's one kind of resilience. Another kind is, oh, I've got water coming over the walls at my fort, or at my Navy base over here in Norfolk. All right, that's some resiliency going to have to happen. So there's a lot of different kinds of resiliency. What I want to, I think the point I want to make is however you address that resiliency, whatever you need to address that resiliency, efficiency should be a part of it because you don't want to over pay or overbuild, right? Yes, we might need to double our electric grid in the future. Golly, I hope not. I know we're electrifying a lot of things, but if we get serious about energy efficiency and reducing our demand, then we can reach that resiliency. We can have a fully operational grid with redundancy without, you know, having renewables built every, every, everywhere love renewables, we install renewables, we need more renewables by a long shot, but we also have to pair that with efficiency. We heard that on the first panel as well today. Jeremy? Yeah, I, I think we've, we've gotten a little bit of a, a warning sign on this and how it bubbles up over the last year and a half, uh, particularly with the, the war in, uh, in, in Ukraine and, and Russian aggression there and, and how that disrupted um, global energy markets. I mean, the globe has, has greatly benefited from the, the uh, nature of global energy markets and the interconnectedness of, of uh, global supply chains, particularly on the affordability side. And the U.S. has benefited significantly there with, with affordable electricity prices. And we see that like, the national security risks are not just here at home. Um, in, in the end, we saw a massive disruption that, that, that occurred um, as, as the globe tried to react to, to Russian aggression in Ukraine, Europeans demanding um, you know, new sources of, of, of energy, U.S. LNG, um, we're seeing the market radically change for things like advanced nuclear, where European countries who had once turned away from nuclear technologies now are demanding U.S. technologies and, and looking to partner with us um, to, to provide more, more energy security. Um, whether and, uh, and, and on the manufacturing side, we've seen that particular, uh, in, in particular. I mean, we saw in Germany and the U.K., uh, you know, Germany had to, to basically ramp down 90% of their aluminum production at a disruption point um, uh, shortly after, after the invasion because they didn't have have uh, fuels needed there. And so the investment that we're making here in the U.S. to try to catalyze new technologies to provide clean energy and to, to ultimately invest in, in supply chains that may not be reliant on more uh, earth scant resources or resources that we're, more, we're reliant on uh, folks like the Russians or, or the Chinese on, uh, I think is, is, is really important. And it's, it's a delicate balance of, of how do we invest in the right way to, to, to maximize economic opportunities of the, the global energy market, but also protect our own entrance and provide some resilience both to the, to the US economy and to our national security. I think we have a question in the back of the room. Or sort of in the back of the room. Thanks. Um, so the Army has a goal to have a microgrid on every installation, but the Army modernization strategy uh, notes that we need some significant research and development in order to make this happen. So I was wondering if you guys could talk about what you think the key lines of effort in terms of research and development are to meet both the microgrid and larger military uh, energy security goals. I usually preface my talk with I'm not the technical expert. Um, on the r and I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I'm not the technical expert. Uh, I do know that the technology is there already, um, and it's good enough that it, microgrids do work. We have a new tactical microgrid standard that we put out in January for contingency bases and forward operating areas. We are putting microgrids. We've already got at least a dozen microgrids on installations. We've got another 25 or so uh, scheduled to be going in over the course of the next year or so, and then another 50 that are in the planning stage. Um, so I'm not sure about the R&D part, about what else would be required, but they, I do know that the technology is there and the Army is moving forward fast and putting them in. I hope that answers your question. Um, Jeremy and others, please feel free to chime in as well. Thanks for the question. 
Yeah, I'd add three key areas that I think that have been uh, uh, have come out of some of these the big policy that's come out over the last couple of years that's really been focused on this. Um, the, the Energy Act and the Infrastructure Bill funded a, a long duration storage partnership between the the DOE and DOD, uh, particularly at, at facilities that are, are ramping up renewables as as their source of electricity. How do we get at this challenge of how do we store not electricity every four hours or six hours, but like uh, deal with the fluctuations with seasons, with weeks, monthly? Uh, you know, and I think that's going to be really important, especially as the military becomes more reliant on, on renewable power. And then two things on, on the nuclear side I would, I would highlight. Um, Allison Air Force Base in, uh, in, in Alaska are actually doing a procurement for a, a micro-reactor to meet their electricity needs there. Really exciting program there that uh, a handful of U.S. companies are looking to compete for. That facility has significant national security implications, has a need for 24-7 for clean energy, and, uh, and obviously the Alaska environment has some, some additional needs. Uh, and and then uh, as we look at forward deployments, there's a, there's a project called Project Pele, which is a, a, a transportable microreactor. Now the Idaho team has been working quite a bit with uh, with the awardees on that, and that's tried to, to get at uh, um, reducing the need for for diesel transportation and things along those lines in, in forward deployments, which is one of the the signature causes of, of casualties um, related to our fuel sources at our operations, uh, which uh, uh, I think is uh, an interesting way to try to get at that and, and tackle it. So those are the type of R D and D programs that, that at least I'm familiar of moving on that I think could directly impact the, the mission that you're, you're uh, asking about. Uh, Jake or Jennifer, do you have anything you'd like to weigh in on or add? Yeah, so one, one thing I will say is I think to, to the Army specifically, we've spent a lot of time working on different bases. Uh, my 15 years at Idaho National Laboratory, I've been to many, uh, both Army, Navy, Air Force, et cetera. And I'll say each one of those locations has a different challenge. They have a different mission, they have a different uh, set of resources, different interaction or different uh, relationship with the community or the host utility. If you now go overseas, that even uh, makes things even more complicated. So when I say my next statement, it's not that the technology doesn't exist today to advance us to where we need to go. It's just there's a lot of elements in here where cybersecurity standards, there's a process called the risk management framework that is one of those opportunities to be followed and understand you know, how, to, how to posture yourself with the best knowledge you have today against some of the threats of tomorrow, and some of them are today, um, but also supply chain. So it may not be a pure research and development challenge to deploy microgrids or clean energy technologies on military bases, but do we know exactly where those technologies are coming from? What's the firmware loaded on each one of those assets? Do we understand how the interoperability between inverter-based resources and other types of technology as we make that transition? Do we know how those are going to work together? Do we have the appropriate training? Think about uh, military personnel. How often do they move around? Quite frequently. So that institutional knowledge of how to operate that asset on base sometimes leads before it even uh, operates. So I, during construction, turns over to operations, people who are there then may not be there tomorrow. So I think when I think of research and development, it's not from a pure technology-only perspective. It's, it's how do all these pieces work together. One thing I can say is uh, Department of Defense very specifically has leveraged the energy savings performance contracts, UESCs, all the other acronyms that you can, you can define. But I would say that DOD has done an excellent job of putting those forward and ensuring that they're working in hand in hand with communities and you know, local utilities to ensure when they go to a microgrid that they're not degrading their resiliency. For me, personally, operating my, my house or my, my neighborhood, sure, I could figure it out. I'm an engineer, my background's power engineering, uh, control systems, but I certainly would not put all that trust in my hands on a daily basis, because I've got other jobs. I've got two daughters at home that like to play t-ball and softball. I certainly can't operate a microgrid like my utility can that I pay every month. So that's another element that I would say um, ensure trust is there between the partners, and that research and development uh, isn't just pure technology needs. And I'll just mention that, uh, yes, there are still R&D needs, particularly for that long-term storage, but this point about operating the systems, these are complicated systems, and often what you find on a military facility, unfortunately, is the guy who's the energy manager is also in charge of the keeping the grounds, you know, the, the lawns cut and the garbage situation, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so as we get these more complicated microgrids, nuclear reactors, for goodness sake, on our military facilities, 
the energy service companies provide that long-term operations, maintenance, expertise, r repair and replacement costs. They do all of those types of things. So that's another real benefit to that public-private partnership we talked about. Thanks. That was a great question and really great responses. Thanks for everybody chiming in on that. That was really cool. Um, we have a question up here in the front, and then I think we'll probably, you'll probably get the last question of the panel. So go ahead. Okay. Big pressure. Um, appreciate the panel. Uh, obviously, as we're electrifying everything, this is great. We're making things more resilient and more efficient. As things are getting more complicated on the grid, certainly with bringing more EVs on uh, and now seeing more distributed energy resources like batteries and all these other things coming on, we're also having AI and other applications to help manage all these very complicated resources better. How do we make sure that we have good enough cybersecurity to handle all that going forward and that we can keep up with the pace of these innovations on the security and the policy side? Whoever would like to take that, Jake, please go ahead and others feel free to weigh in. Excellent question. I, I think um, I'll make two, two points, probably not an answer, but I'll make, make two points in response. Is first off, intellectual property. I think uh, one of the op opening remarks that I wanted to make was some of our nation's greatest assets are our people. And it's that intellectual property that they develop, that innovation that gets created. Um, I think we have to stay on the track that we're on, but also not forget that we have to be innovative to things we don't even know about. We're also building tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning that maybe puts us in a position where we are informing a system that we may not understand quite yet. Uh, there's a lot of interoperability between control systems that we don't necessarily know how they operate uh, to all layers of the machine learning process. Uh, and so when we think about cybersecurity, we've got to, have a, we've got to have a standardized approach, but it does not mean that a standard will solve the question that you had. Yes, we need to do better on standards, we need to do better on partnerships between vendors and communication protocols, but I think we're, what we're really, what worries me the most, I would say, to, to help not answer your, but maybe the, make your question a little bit more difficult to answer is, we are not informing the people who are trying to solve those problems at a fast enough pace. We don't have enough people working on cybersecurity, full stop. All right. Um, other comments? I'm not going to disagree with anything Jake said. Uh, it is definitely an issue. Um, as we're putting 21st, 21st century technology on, we're electrifying everything. It's just getting more and more high tech. Um, and you know, Jennifer wasn't wrong either when she was talking about the energy managers. Um, our installations have been traditionally underfunded um, across the services. People would rather fund and buy aircraft carriers and fighter jets and battle tanks rather than putting uh, money into the installations. We've seen that uh, as a result. Uh, everyone sees in the news the problem with barracks um, across the services, moldy rooms, poor conditions that soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines have to live in. Uh, we're addressing that problem. We're finally, you know, Secretary Warmoth has acknowledged we need to actually fund the installations. Um, and like I said, as that line between the operations and the installations grays out uh, and eventually disappears, um, senior commanders, I've had three-star generals come and tell me, look, don't give me another tank. Give me this funding for the installation. You know, the, that's the division commander saying that. Um, they're, they're seeing where it's coming together. Uh, we've got to end on, you know, if installations are the traditionally underfunded part of the military, garrison staffs are the traditionally underfunded part of the traditionally underfunded installations. Um, DPWs have been cut to the bones. Um, our energy managers, like Jen said, they're GS-12s. Um, those are the people that are going to manage these high-tech energy systems. They don't get paid a whole lot of money. Um, they have 17 other jobs to do. Sometimes energy manager is a collateral duty. Um, how are we going to do that? We've got to look at how we pay and train and retain our garrison staffs and realize that uh, we've got to invest in the installations and the people on the installations because they're a critical part of the battle strategy. Um, it's not just the soldier on the front line because the soldier's not going to get to the front line without the people back uh, at home getting them out the door. So we do work closely with cyber. We've got uh, the cyber office is actually right down the hall from my office. Uh, their team is in with us regularly whenever we're talking about this stuff. As we're talking about the putting EV chargers onto the installations, uh, they were sitting at the table working with us. Um, how are we going to do that? Um, you know, the dumb chargers are easy, but the smart chargers, which for POVs we've got to uh, be able to do, how are we going to do that? Uh, and then the solar 
um, the microgrid connections, the battery storage, all of it. Um, so yes, it is a big challenge. We are aware of it. Not quite sure how we're going to solve it yet. I don't want to just complicate things. And I will say that each of the services is working on sort of cybersecurity protocols. So when they do have the you know, smart everything integrated into the grid, they're thinking about what are the protocols, what's the, t they're, all, they're all building test facilities, and you got to certify this and certify that, and that's all terrific, but it's not standard. Every base is different. We talked about this. Every base needs something different, have different resources. So almost all of it has to be individualized for bases. So while we're trying to, you know, deal with that in a comprehensive manner, it still ends up being not as comprehensive as we might like and always changing. Jeremy, even if you don't have a response to the question, if you'd like to have the last word on the panel, I feel like you, you, I don't want to leave you out. So. No, I, I would just reinforce, like, these are all major challenges that we're going to have to tackle over, over the coming decades. And I'm encouraged by the, the really strong bipartisan support that we've seen over the, over the last couple of Congresses in this space. Um, I mean, there's been four or five occasions where uh, legislation getting across the finish line would have been the most significant bill since 2005 or, 2000, or the 2007 bill. And so we've really seen, I think we take for granted the influx of, of energy policy that has gotten across the finish line in recent years. And so, and, and I think it's going to be required because as, as folks underscore, like the, the conditions on the ground and in the global markets are changing rapidly. And so for the U.S. to lead, we're going to be, have to be nimble and, and, and ready to to, to hop, invest, and, and seize in, in opportunities and in, and in solving some challenges that we, we have to tackle to, to really ensure our competitiveness. And, and sorry to the panel, we had a little noise back there, but I'll assure you it's all in service of getting the reception set up. So I can confirm that there's a bar set up. So sorry about that, but hopefully it's worth it. Um, Paul, Jake, Jennifer, and Jeremy, Thank you so much for joining us today. I think they deserve a great round of applause for their great comments.